morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to June Gobi Monthly Seminar. Today, we have the honor to have Dr. Ramu Puna from Dr. Ida Buckler's lab to present to us an overview on the uh, practical hub laptop. Last week, uh, they just had uh, 40 participants uh, from five continents uh, at Cornell held a successful, sorry, uh, for the whole week, they had a, a training. So Dr. Ramu is a genomic selection application coordinator and a project manager for genomic selection by sequencing project, which uh, formerly was a RAMSEQ project funded by uh, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation. So they have uh, six uh, crops. Uh, Ramu is the sequencing project uh, coordinating for these uh, crops to be implemented. implemented. So the six crops are maize, wheat, sorghum, chickpea, uh, rice, and also uh, uh, cassava. So uh, Ramu is uh, actively involved in developing cheap and high throughput scheme se sequencing genotyping technologies, also a uh, bioinformatic pipeline called a practical haplotype graph to generate the genotypes from scheme seek uh, technology mode uh, they are applied in genomic selection. So he joined Cornell in March 2014 to work on cassava genetic load project and how uh, very accomplished in many uh, publications. Uh, we should congratulate uh, Ramu. Last year, he published uh, deleterious uh, mutations in cassava in Nature uh, Genetics Journal. So with that, uh, let's uh, give our floor to Ramu to give an overview on practical uh, haplotype graph. So today I'm going to talk on uh, uh, an overview of practical haplotype graph for what we've seen from the last one year. So even though I'm presenting here, this is a group effort. I listed all the people here. So all the uh, developers the, and the leader at Berkeley. So firstly, first look at the, what we are going to do, how we are going to do the future genotyping. So in the future, we expect that your cell phone will be your sequencing machine. So you can use your sequencing machine. You can buy a Smith Giant. So this Smith Giant is uh, developed in a Nanopore technology. It's a Nanopore. So you can connect your sequencing, connect your mobile. Then you can load the sample data, and you can generate the one to two gig data, and you can load that into your. Also, it may be a mobile genotyping. So it may be for anything. So for doing that one, you need you just uh, go to the field and collect the lab sample, leaf sample and generate, uh, isolate the DNA using the low-cost easy DNA feed, and use this mid and connect to your uh, mobile phone and generate the low coverage sequence. So the question here is, when we generate the low coverage sequences, bioinformatics is still challenging to process the skin sequences. To address this question, we developed the practical haplotype graph to is a solution to infer the genotypes from the skin sequences. Here I listed uh, a web page where the, all the details for the practical haplotype graph is available. It's coming to the question, what is a PHG? PHG stands for practical haplotype graph. This is a representation of the multiple genomes, or it may be, it's like a planned genome, and it represents the variation present in the complete population, or it may be a complete species. It's a computational framework, and it's a database and use it to impute the variance from the scheme sequences. And the primary goal we you develop this one is to generate the, or call the genotypes from the te technology independent scheme sequences. That means the beauty of the PHG is it can take a wide range of uh, sequencing length in, as input to generate the uh, genotypes. It may be 150 base pair, or it may be 80 base pair, or it may be a few KB also. So it, it can take any range of uh, sequence length. Okay, please stop me if you are, uh, have any question. So we still call this as a practical because we use this as a reference genome to communicate to the, uh, uh, or to address the, or to load the, all the variants available in a species. So we need a, some baseline. That's why we use, use the reference genome and we call this as a practical. So this the practical haplotype graph also works around the difficult regions of the genome. And it's, as I told you, it is to exploit the, so can you exploit the cheap sequencing rates and use the genome combinate that community has been developed and uses of the self-genotyping software like GATK 
can be used by the both breeding purpose as well as the genomics purpose. I will cover a little bit on the genomic side as well as the uh, breeding side. When we generate the sequences, sequence is nothing but a haplotype. So we use the haplotypes in general, we align to the reference genome, then we call the SNPs. And we use the SNPs again, we, we use the SNPs to phase these haplotypes again. So that means you are losing the information at the sequence level and calling the SNPs and you are trying back to phase them again. So instead of that one, we thought of using the, without losing the haplotype information, we use the complete sequence information and uh, uh, generate the genotypes. So how we can be develop the genotype? So for this, to develop a pH database in any species, we need to have high depth genome, whole genome sequencing data, or it may be a genome assemblies. You can use any one of them. So it takes the, any one of them and the reference genome and uh, generates the GVCF here. Then GVCF uses to generate the haplotypes. Haplotypes can be generated at a regular intervals. The intervals is, is coming from the reference genome. That's why we call as a reference genome. It are basically reference genome coordinates. So we can use a, any, any region of our interest as an interval and generate the haplotypes in that particular interval. So, so as we know, the pan genome is captures a genomic variation of all species. So this is how the variation in a pan genome is represented. This is as a, represented as a graph. And it, at a given position, if there is a uh, SNP, it can be represented as a bubble. So uh, we know that graph is a better representation of the pan genome. So there are so many, already many are human genomics people also using to develop the uh, haplotype uh, pan genomes. So this is to address, we have a lot of ambiguity and we know that intergenic regions are in the crazy. So we, we are, all the alignment tools are not aware of the graph. But if you take any example here, in there is an intergenic region, it contains a lot of uh, intergenic, a uh, uh, lot of structure. So what about the practical haplotype? How we are going to do this? We know that biology produces a consistent, we know that the genes and the flanking regions are highly conserved and the non, uh, non-conserved intergenic regions with tremendous. So we know that the, here, this is a conserved region and here is another conserved region with gene. And between these two genes, you can see a lot of uh, variation, uh, insertion and deletions may contribute to the uh, structural variation. So how do we do, uh, how do we develop the practical haplotype graph in any species? We take the reference genome and we divide into a reference intervals of anything. The interval may be any region of your interest. So you can uh, build like this. Here is the reference interval one. It's a red, left side, left hand side, red one. And the right side is the reference interval three in between connecting the intergenic region as a reference interval two. So if you see at the bottom, there is a coordinate system here. One, two, five, it represents the interval one. And the six to 16 is basically representing interval two. And the seven to 21 is representing interval three. So this is for our sake of our convenience, we use as a reference genome as a uh, communication system to interpret, to call the, to generate the pan genome in any species. So, so these intervals may be of, uh, for our convenience, we can divide these intervals into anything, for example, genic interval or intergenic interval. So this is for our convenience only. So, but you can use anything whichever of your interested genome, interest region of your interest. So it doesn't mean that it contains the genome. It can be anything on the genome. So we can use or ignore any set of the, the beauty of here is if you know that if the particular some gene, some gene interval is a very complex, you don't need to worry about that one. You can simply avoid that particular regions. So here, if we know that the uh, intergenic regions are highly complex, so we can avoid this one. For example, then you have the interval one containing the gene and flanking region and the reference interval three containing the genes and flanking region the, and the adjacent flanking region. So, so certain interval, so we can prioritize these intervals only. We can remove those uh, intergenic intervals. So these, once you remove these intergenic intervals, these communicate one inter reference interval to be another reference interval is uh, attached to based on the transition probabilities in a species. This transition probabilities reflects a population under study, or it may be a breeding program parents. 
or it may be anything. If you look at this graph, so at the below a given example, MO17 and OH43 in maize, in the reference interval gene level two, there are two, gene, two haplotypes. There is a haplotype, both are sharing here. So that's why you don't need to have this information. Both should be graph here, like, a, so in the interval one, two and three coming to the uh, interval, uh, interval three, the second node or second haplotype. That's how we can reduce a lot of information to store in the database. So this is how you can generate uh, 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 haplotypes. So once we find the intervals, the next question is, how do I identify the haplotypes and how do I identify the uh, consensus haplotypes? So now we are moving to into this uh, box portion. Once you know that what is the reference interval of your interest and what's your, you don't want uh, or you want to eliminate, you can, leave, you can leave only the intervals of your interest. Then you use those intervals to generate the haplotypes from the GVCF files. How do we develop this one? So if you take a chromosome, chromosome basically a phase, contains a phased haplotypes with a conserved and non-conserved region. This is how it's look like. So this a blue portion is basically a conserved region or it may be a, a gene and the black portion is basically an intergenic region. Each, uh, no, each blue portion is called as a haplotype. A sequence is called as a haplotype sequence. And these haplotype sequence, adjacent haplotype sequence are connected to with the uh, edge probabilities. So how do we develop here in a species? So for example, if you take a one interval, you can first generate the, all the haplotypes across the population. Here I'm showing an example of, so 15 taxa left side, T1 to T15. So at a given interval, so here I mentioned as gene one, at a gene one, we can generate all possible haplotypes we see, all haplotypes we see coming from individual here. So once we identify this one, then we can group them based on this divergence. So for example, similarity based on the divergence, so we can group them as a haplotype group one. Then the group, uh, green ones can go into the haplotype group two, and orange is group haplotype three, and uh, purple is haplotype four. Once we identify this, all these uh, groups, then in a given uh, group, we can generate the consensus haplotype. Consensus haplotype is basically condensing all these four haplotypes into single haplotypes, but we still maintain where these uh, variants are coming from in the consensus sequences. Like that, we can generate the consensus uh, haplotype one from the haplotype group one sequences, like that we do for the haplotype two. So this is, we are looking at one, uh, interval actually. So if you look at the chromosome scale or the genome scale, first you need to identify all the haplotypes coming from all the individuals like that you, you can generate here. Then you can condense to generate the consensus haplotypes. All these consensus haplotypes are connected to the edge probabilities. Each line represents the uh, strength, uh, the thickness of the line represents the strength of the uh, probability or the weightage. So this is how you hear, for example, in a given third uh, interval, so among all 10, 15 lines, you may be having only two haplotypes, condensed haplotypes, or two haplotype groups. So that's why you have only two condensed haplotypes. So they have the all transition probability to connect to the next uh, adjacent intervals. So this is how we can reduce a lot of uh, storage information. So we can reduce the memory footprint. And when we condense this one, we are increasing the haplotype coverage for better inequality analysis. So this is how you generate the uh, practical haplotype database for a given species. So once you generate the consensus haplotypes, that ends for the generation of the haplotype or the PhD database in a given species. Is there any questions so far? Hi. Hey. Okay. This is Kate. I have a, a question. Uh -huh. um, and maybe you mentioned this, but what happens if there are like chromosomal rearrangements and these haplotypes are separated on different chromosomes in different varieties? Yes, uh, that's a good question. So here we are using the reference genome as a, a communication system. So what happens here is all the genes on the uh, given reference or uh, uh, consensus are on the reference intervals. You are getting all these genes information from the reference genome. But if a gene is present in the non-reference genome that will go into the uh, intergenic regions or intergenic region in the reference genome. 
So you still have a intergenic region, so that will generate the consensus. So if the non-reference allele contains a different gene, that is also still available in the intergenic region. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hi, this is Kevin. Yep. Um, I noticed from your last graph, it looks like you're probably representing this as a hidden Markov model. Yes, that, that I will talk a bit later. later. Okay, I, I'm curious. So how, are you, how can you be sure of long range phasing? Do you have information from long reads or are you ignoring that? Or? Uh, first we generate this uh, intervals based on the uh, uh, phasing only. So we phase only that is interval level only. So, okay. so basically this uh, PhD is uh, currently developed for inbred species. Ah, okay, thanks. So the phasing, we are still working on that one for the heterozygous species. That's a good question. We are still uh, working on that, how to phase uh, these uh, uh, long range intervals in the heterozygous species. For the, in case of uh, inbreds, I don't think that's a real problem. Mm -hmm. Very well. So that's the, once you develop the practical haplotype graph in a species, so that PhD can be used for any purpose. So it, it can be used for the genomic purpose as like pan genome and uses, and it is a, a, like a database to store a lot of information. It's a computational framework and it may be a genotyping purpose or information tool. I will go one by one here. So the pan genome, as I already told, so it can be used for the any genomic purpose. If you have a, a 10 to 20 quality assemblies, for example, if you take B73 and uh, W22, 18% of the two genes intervals are were shared between the B73 and W22. So this all this information will be loaded. So once you loaded this one, you can generate, when you do the genotyping, you can generate the custom genome, custom genome sequences very easily. So we have the plugins to how to generate the custom complete genome level or complete FASTA file from the a given sequence. And grammatical reduce the problem with alignment and it can be used for a map-based cloning of the genes. So as we know that haplotype is a represented, uh, haplotype captures a uh, lot of information or it may be a product from the promoter and enhancers. Uh, so we can use, if you annotate, pro, if you annotate well all these haplotypes, we can uh, study how this haplotype or the expression of the haplotype is uh, or, uh, epistatically interacting with a promoter on an ancestor region. If you model perfectly, we can study the epistatic interaction here. And these haplotypes can be uh, annotated with the different information like frame shift mutation, is there an alternate splicing, and promoter strength based on the expression level, and there's some deleterious mutation, and you can use a yield estimate, maybe it's calculate the GBBs at a particular interval and store that information to use further in the genomic selection as well at a haplotype level. So coming to the database, so PhD is basically a database. This is how the pipelines look like. So I already covered a lot of information here. So first we identify the anchor as interval regions or anchor regions and load the database reference genome and create the haplotypes using the GVCF or the any whole genome sequencing information and the create the consensus. And if you have the assemblies, you can also load the assemblies and uh, store into a, a database. So if you, once you store into the database, it can be accessible and you can download any uh, sequence of the haplotype at any given uh, interval of your interest, then you can use for further studies. So it's basically a, a computational framework, sorry. So we know that genomic selection accuracy uh, frequently saturated at a few thousand loci. So you don't need to have the thousands and thousands of the uh, SNPs. And as we know that most of the biological information goes through the genes. So in case of maize, we have 80,000, um, 80 million SNPs. So if we able to identify these haplotypes, uh, if you put that information into the haplotypes at a gene scale, so we can have only 37,000 or 38,000 genes or 38,000 individuals, you know, 38,000 data points for a given individual. So all this information captured by the 80,000 million uh, SNPs also will be captured by the uh, haplotypes. So we can reduce the memory footprint only use the, and using only 37,000 uh, genes information. That can be used for the genomic selection purpose as well. And as I told you, the, it's, uh, for example, 
if you take any given interval and if you have a only 10 consensus haplotypes at a given interval from a, in a population, this 10% uh, 10 consensus haplotype may capture greater than 90% of the common variation occurring in a species. If you're coming to the breeding population, it may be equal to 99%. So coming to the haplotype storage, as we know that genome has a 2B, 2 gig in case of maize, so if you have the 10 haplotypes in a given uh, interval, so if you generate the first of all, so 10 into 2 gig, so it's basically generate the 20 gig database and generates the, all this 10 hap, consensus haplotypes information in a database. So as agnist, if you want to store the 50,000 genomes and if you want to store only those haplotypes information of say 40 KB, it may be equivalent to 2 KB. As agnist, if you want to store the whole genome sequence information, each one with the 2 GB and 50,000 genomes, it is approximately equivalent to 100 terabyte. So 100 terabyte information, either it can uh, reduce down to 2, 2 GB or 20 GB. So even you can use a computational framework. So we designed, uh, we distribute this PHG as a Docker system. And it's relatively straightforward to run. And so this Docker contains a lot of uh, other, uh, other com compatible uh, uh, softwares, for example, Linux and GATK and Minimap, SAM tools and BWA, all that information is stored in a container as a Docker container. We distribute as a Docker. So you can use that into any, so it can support to, or it can run in any operating system. So using this, so it's, that's why we say that using the Docker image makes it easy to replicate any analysis as well and easy to run. So the most important and uh, application of the PHG is uh, uh, genotyping and imputation. So the question here is, so we are thinking the basic idea here is, so you make the crosses, then you generate the progeny. So the progeny will be sequenced at uh, uh, maybe low coverage, and this uses the PHG. For developing the PHG, we generate the whole genome sequencing from the founder lines or maybe species level or any other information uh, taxa, then you download the PSG. The PSG can be used to impute the whole genome sequence, impute the scheme sequences and gender the GBVs and evaluate. Once you select a parents in a given cycle, so those parents will be, you don't need to generate the 10x coverage of those parents in each every cycle. You just uh, sequence only one to two or maybe 3x coverage. So you can generate the haplotypes coming from those uh, uh, selected parent in each cycle, put that into the PHG. Okay, among all thousand, you don't need to put all thousand uh, tags available in the PHG database. You can condition by selecting only of your parents, maybe 10 parents or maybe two parents. You can condition on that one, then you can easily impute all your progeny. That's how the basically uh, imputation and the genotyping can work using the PHG. So coming to the, what are the different uh, scheme sequencing technologies available? So we developed the uh, uh, cheap and robust uh, genotyping technologies called Nextera and Itrusic. It's a whole genome sequencing based. And we are using the Nanopore. We are trying to develop the 96 or 384 Plex here. And the RH Hampsic. So we are collaborating with IDT and uh, Intertech people to make, uh, to design assays for targeted 1500 to 2000 loci. And also another uh, availability, another available source of the scheme sequencing is .seq LD. It's basically coming from the .seq uh, based in Australia. It's like a GBS. The beauty of all these technologies is they work with very low quality DNA and they are very, very cheap. I'm not going to in detail how this works, but I will detail once you generate your sequences come from these sequences, then we can use uh, our PSG to call the genotypes. How this works? So you have the uh, sharp trees coming from one uh, individual, then you can align to a reference genome as well as the haplotype graph. This haplotype graph, basically we are aligning to the uh, consensus sequences. Then based on the consensus, once they are aligned, we can count whether uh, how many haplotypes are, uh, uh, we can count the number of sequences going at a given uh, consensus uh, sequences. Then, you, because of the scheme sequences, we are not able to touch all the all possible uh, intervals in the genome. We may be randomly touching here and there. So we can use the hidden Markov model to make a 
a decision to forgive, to make a path across the genome. For this one, we also we may or may if available, we can use the pedigree information. If not, we it can take its own decision to pass to the hidden marker model. And once you identify the path in a, for a given individual, so we can output either a haplotypes or it may be a SNPs or if you may be a whatever or it may be a custom genome you can generate it it's there are different options how you uh, output currently we are outputting the SNPs as well as the haplotype sequences but uh, faster for the custom genome level reference genome we are not outputting right now but in the future we will be doing that one so in this process using the skin sequences the key element is a pointing through the graph using the hidden marker model so how this will be done as you know, this is uh, how the look like the consensus haplotypes in the genome. So once we have this particular haplotypes uh, from the genome, we can use to, uh, you, can be, you can first identify the similarity and identify the genotypes. So how this works, so for at a given, um, so this is how the uh, sequence level, the PhD database look like, for example, and you generate a scheme sequences from an individual. For example, here, there are four sequences here, they generated. Once you generate it, you just align to the um, consensus haplotypes in the database. So it will go and align to the particular sequences. So here you see, even there is no sequence here, 80. So it has an 80 sequence here, and it is an 80 TC sequence here, and 80 TC and GAA sequence. So it will be captured in between the fifth reference interval is missing. But it uses a imputation tool to capture that information. So for a given individual, if you supply that particular sequences, it makes a, a guess and a hidden marker model makes uh, generates the haplotype like this. One blue color and followed by the green color here. So this is how it generates the genotypes and imputation. So aligning the scheme sequence also helps to identify the recombination e events. So as you saw in the previous plot, so the parental lines, for example, going on the top line, another parent going in the bottom line, but your path goes to, from blue to green, that indicates that there is a possibility after the recombination is, event is happening in the progeny. So that's, that's how you can generate the you know, genotypes and the, uh, sorry, imputation. This is how it looked like the path. So in case of maze, we use the B97 reads and throw into the maze database. And this is how the, uh, uh, this is uh, approximately 10 intervals, consecutive intervals. So the red is the path where the practical haplotype graph or hidden marker model took as the, as the path. But you can see some places there is a green and a red together. So green indicates that there is an actual B73 is present in that particular node, but it takes the red node. That means the green is the right choice, the red is the uh, wrong choice of the node, wrong choice of the haplotypes. So this is uh, basically an error. So we are trying to in, uh, improve how we can reduce errors. There is a different possibilities that the, given the short reads are very small, something like 150 base pair regions. So this particular region may not able to distinguish between say the green and uh, uh, red uh, consensus. Yeah. That's why it may be mm -hmm. going to any case. So that's how this is just, I want to show you the, how the prior, uh, prior, sorry, the path look like in a given speed, in a given, for a given individual. So coming to the case study, so we developed this in uh, so far in case of uh, maize and sorghum. So I will present some of the case uh, results from sorghum. So initially this is uh, sorghum basically targeting the Chibas breeding program. So we developed the 37 taxa. We sequenced the 37 taxa and uh, all the progenies are scheme sequenced using the next era sequences. Then we put that into the um, practical haplotype graph. Then comparing the results with uh, GBS, with the same samples where, where we have the GBS information. With the GBS, initially we have the very high prediction accuracy for a given trait, but the uh, PHG is, did a very poor information. So this is because of, we have very few number of, uh, few number of um, uh, taxa in the uh, database, and these taxa are the breeding lines, and they are very close relatives. So 
So there, the idea transition probability is equal uh, something like 0.5. There are only two haplotypes out of 34. So the transmission probability is only point, uh, so 0.5. So it's not making a correct decision in the hidden marker model. So this is also another highlights the reason that if you develop with a practical haplotype graph with a large number of uh, stacks, it may added approximately another uh, 300 lines into the existing uh, Chibas database. Then we we throw the same, we throw the, all the scheme sequences from the progenies. Then we can see the GBS and the practical haplotype graph information generating exactly almost same range of, or it seems to be a little bit higher in case of practical haplotype graph. So this suggests that when you develop the practical haplotype graph in a given species, it's better to throw all available or population scale information or the more number of taxa into the database. Once you develop the database, then you can condition only on those selected parents. There may be some 30 selected parents. This is how in case of sorghum is done. So the 400 uh, taxa is developed, uh, 400 taxa is used to develop the practical haplotype graph in sorghum. Then we condition when we running through the uh, hidden marker model, we conditioned only to select only 30 parents, which is related. So that's how it's picking up or equal, the genomic selection accuracy is almost equal to the PhD. So coming to the summary, so the PhD can be used for as a genome purpose or the breeding purpose. And so what does the PhD chain in the future? So it's easy to produce a custom genomes for the breeding purpose and the PhD pipelines, it replaces the G uh, GBS, RAMSIC, and low uh, coverage informatics pipeline. So that's why we call this as the, a common pipeline. It can take the scheme, uh, scheme sequences generated from any technology of any lens. So in the future, we are going to integrate this uh, with the VG variation graph as well as the graph typer to make a better view uh, to see the, the graph in the path, graph, uh, paths in the graph. So the limitations of the PhD is uh, currently is still active under development and uh, we are testing only using the, uh, all this, uh, using the breeding program, breeding program materials. That means it's very limited to currently to the inbred species. And we are working with the uh, cassava, it's a highly heterogeneous species. And Chi and uh, group, uh, me and Chi are working on how to use the GVCF files and how to phase the information and how to load that information and store the two haplotypes at a given reference interval. So this, that work is still under uh, pending. So where we are going. So this will improve the haplotype identification with low coverage and it will store the rare allele uh, amendments to consensus and improves the GS performance. And in the future, we are going to integrate the PSG with the Gobi and we are going to develop the GUI it may be a drivers for the Tracel or maybe R, it may be Jupiter, it can be done for any, somebody can write a wrap up for this one so they can be applied to anywhere and also used for the annotation of the haplotypes. So into the same lines where we are going in the future, as I already told you uh, in the starting, we are going to on-site genotyping. So with, I would like to end with the same conclusion like we are moving towards the on-site uh, on genotyping. So how this works is, you can go to the field, collect the leaf, and use the low uh, or cheap DNA extraction methods, extract the DNA, then use your computer or cell phone, uh, use the nanopore to sequence those reads, then use those reads can be passed to the practical haplotype graph to generate the genotypes. So this practical haplotype graph is, will be integrated to the GOBI, GOBI uh, database. So, so this will be available. So the users can be directly upload their sequences in the Gobi, then you can call the genotypes. And the genotypes can be automatically loaded into the decision support tools like uh, genomic selection available, already pipelines are available in Gobi. So you can use those uh, pipelines and generate the GBVs and select the parents. That's how you can go uh, uh, genotyping in the future, on-site genotyping. So you don't need to uh, depend on any service providers. So there is a uh, time lag if you depend on the service providers, something like two months or three months. It may not meet your uh, requirements to select the parents. So coming to the training, so last week as Star mentioned, we finished the first training course during the last week. 
So there are 40 participants representing the from five continents, representing six species. We initiated the practical prototype graph for all six species. So, so good, good to know that one. And the upcoming uh, training courses on PhD. One is in ERI. So immediately after the Gobi annual meeting is on uh, maybe on 17th and 18th. So if anybody interested, please let me or Lisa can know this one so we can add to your participants list. And then another uh, next training program will be in Ghana, Waki in November. With that, I would like to acknowledge all our Bakla Lab people and uh, Genomic Diversity Facility here and all our collaborators. And finally, thank BMGF for supporting this. And any questions? Any questions? No questions here. That was an excellent overview. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, Ramo. Yes, Susan. Can you hear me? Yes. I have a, I have a question. You mentioned yep. uh, that example in Sorghum. So you yep. added more um, lines into the database, and I get you got better prediction results. Uh -huh. So usually, usually the genetic relationship of the lines um, for genomic selection is really important. So would yes. you think it's important that the, the genomic information or the whole genome information we add, that these are two gene pool related lines of individual treatment programs? Um, I'm not sure whether I, I got your question correctly. Uh, it's a lot of nice. But you want to say that uh, so you want to have the lot of, uh, you want to use the kinship information? No, so, so what I was saying that usually the relationship matrix is important in uh, prediction. Yes. But if the uh, genomic information that is in the database is coming from lines that are probably less related from your gene pool, would you oh. think that this is an issue? No, no, no. So you, you, you don't, so this is for our convenience. So you don't need to be restricted to the genes information. You can be restricted, you can be, uh, the reference interval will be of any interest. For example, in case of uh, uh, cassava, we are thinking to have the uh, uh, GBS uh, code, GBS uh, information we already have. So we are trying to develop the uh, uh, intervals near and around the GBS information and near and around, which are having LD with the genes. Mm -hmm. So, so it, that may be a lot of information flowing around in the intergenic regions. So if you have the similar information or the similar uh, prediction accuracy coming from the gene, or we don't care if you are, uh, if you are sitting in the same ballpark. Mm, okay. Thank you. So Ramu, as we discussed uh, during workshop, maybe for quick, this intergenic region is important because things are yes. uh, all in three genomes and uh, more conjunct than the intergenic region. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I know that in case of uh, wheat, you already have a lot of exome capture information, or which are the maybe more polymorphic regions on the genome, or which are giving the more information on the genome. You can restrict your uh, reference intervals to that particular genome, then you can use that information. If you have the intergenic regions information, that's very well. It's, you can use that. Yeah, our GBS tags like uh, and uh, Exon capture, uh, mm -hmm. we have to some way to connect them. Otherwise, we have a lot of GBS data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, you can use the GBS uh, uh, with whichever the interest of your sites or maybe alleles are the low side. You can target those regions and develop that uh, interval around that particular region. It totally can be done. Yeah, maybe maybe our uh, the referencing situation may be different. Like we have to extend outside the, the gene. Yeah, I, I agree on that. 
Yeah, it may include parcelating and the others. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, if you want to include, yes, you, you definitely are, you can include, no problem. Yeah. Hi, Ramon. Yeah, this is Star. Yep. Yeah. So for so the six crops, uh, PhD project already covered. What kind of timeline, uh, I would say, for the, uh, the pan genome for all the six crops relatively, are they all in place? Not, not yet. Uh, now we, from the last week, we have a hackathon for three, two days for each species. So we know what, uh, what now we are uh, each, uh, there is a coordinator or there may, for each uh, species, they are responsible for developing the PhD database. So now what they are doing is they're uh, uh, collecting all the resources available across the globe. So you don't need to develop a, uh, one uh, PhD database for each breeding program. You just put everything into one database, then you can condition based on your parents. So that's the reason currently all the people are uh, communicating with uh, other resources, other research groups and get the information. Probably I guess maybe another three to four months, all the PhD database may be available, I guess. Right, yeah. So I see it's pretty uh, critical to have very diverse uh, founder lines representing each of the crop in order to have really accurate uh, prediction accuracy. I would say even for the imputation in the future, all the progeny generated need to have the founder lines as the reference genome. Is that right? Uh, actually, you have. It's better to have the large number on the diverse germplasm in the database. So when that's how you can generate the large number of uh, consensus haplotypes in a given interval. So once you have the consensus intervals in a given interval, then you can condition the, in the genotyping stage. You can select. You don't need to select all these taxa. You can generate. Uh, you can say, I need only the from the PhD database. You select only these four taxa, which are my parents but still use the uh, consensus coming from the, all the lines. So it automatically calculates the transition probabilities for those lines, then you use that transition probabilities to, to genotype and impute your gene sequences. That's how you can reduce a lot of uh, uh, storage and cost, everything. That's why we suggest you to put maximum number of diverse lines into the PhD. Right, yeah. This is Liz. Um, yes, please. I just had one more question about the binning of the, of the haplotypes. So it looks like you're binning um, haplotypes which just have small numbers of SNP differences into the same consensus haplotype. How do crops decide at what level to bin into a single haplotype? Uh, is there an optimum number of haplotypes for genomic selection to, to work? Or um, uh, it's not you just have to test it? Uh, it's basically it's, you have to test it. Currently, okay. we support uh, the two uh, two two levels of uh, condensation. One is based on the divergence, and one is based on grouping the clustering. So it's basically com coming to the same question. But uh, here I'm not saying you can you can group all these in uh, at a given uh, anchor. All these 15 lines, for example, you can cluster them, then make a cutoff. So which haplotype is going to which, which group? So mm -hmm. like that you can make a decision. So it's a trial and error, which uh, we need to work for, for each species, this one. And how many different iterations of binning did you try for maize before you found a, a good uh, it, it's optimum still, number? Uh, yeah, we are still uh, uh, checking with this one. So we did a lot of testing and we finally came to a 1% divergence. That is a species, uh, maize has a 1% divergence. Mm. So. 1.5% divergence, so we use the 1% divergence. Okay. But in case of sorghum, 1% divergence is very high. Mm. So they're all becoming into a single cluster. <laughs> That's why when the sorghum case, when they use the 34 parents, they're not able to make it a good prediction because everything is getting into one or okay. two. So there is no transition probability coming up. That's the reason the, we reduce the transition probability to 0 0.001, means 0 0.0. 0.01%. Then we are able to distinguish all the haplotypes. Then we are able to get a very good prediction. Okay. So this, we need to, this 
statistics, we all the parameters we have to optimize for each and every species. There is no hard rule. So right. everyone has to be experiment. So it can be it can be for different population too. It should be. right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It, different it breeding programs. Yes. Thank you, Ramu. Great talk. Thank you. Wonderful uh, overview. Okay. Thank you, Stuart, for Gobi. Thank you.